Hey, Serge, it's Carrie. Hey, I'm waiting for you. I know, I'm, I'm just a few minutes away, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on something, okay? Sure. Okay, I've got Mackenzie with me. Did I tell you I was bringing Mackenzie? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to have Mackenzie film our time together on... Because on... I have some really interesting information to share with you. Sure, sounds good. Okay, all right, so see you just in a few minutes. I'll be there, it looks like six minutes. Okay. Okay, see you in a bit. Okay. Okie dokie, bye. Bye. I never saw this coming, that, uh, that my life would... Uh, would go this way. The tide comes in. Hey, Serge. Pull some sand back into the ocean. How are you? Good to see you. The land is lost, another fight it cannot win. The cycle. Serge was homeless and living on the streets of Hollywood. Serge grew up inside Scientology and was declared psychotic by the Church of Scientology after a fireworks accident. When Serge had his accident, he lost both of his hands and his eye, and therefore Scientology considered they no longer had any use for Serge. He was a liability to them. He had been living on L. Ron Hubbard Way, right next to the big blue buildings in Los Angeles at the time of the accident. Scientology's approach was to get Serge out and away and have nothing further to do with him. The first part of this story is really about Carrie and how she got him off the streets, and then she got him into a home Carrie sort of tag-teamed how the Aftermath Foundation would be able to help Serge. Carrie was working for a project in Hollywood. It was a beautification project for the Hollywood Boulevard area. And as part of the project, they wanted to clean up the Hollywood Boulevard. And part of getting that cleaned up was to help the homeless people get into homes or get into hospitals or get them the help that they needed so that they wouldn't be homeless. I first started talking to Serge through Carrie, and I would tell her something and then she would relay it. For the longest time, it was just getting a note back and forth. And I think the main reason that was is because Serge was essentially nonverbal for the most part. Serge. There you go, big guy. Right. Dude, this is the first time I've seen you in like 30 years, I think. Wow. <laughs> do you remember me when I when we when I used to live around the complex? You do? Yeah. Yeah? Oh my god, dude, it's good to see you. Do you remember when you signed your C or contract for the first time? Um I signed it when I was 11. So they, they um, took me out of high school while I was in junior high. Um, they were gonna uh, prescribe me with Ritalin, um, a psychiatric drug. And um, uh, Scientology doesn't believe in psychiatry. So um, I was, I was, that was as much schooling as I got was junior high. Um, I joined the Sea Org, it was for a billion years. You know, I, I took it seriously and I thought um, being the Sea Org for a whole lifetime and then I would die and then I joined the Sea Org again. That's when you signed a Sea Org contract? Yeah. When you were 11 years old? Yeah. A billion years. Where do you live at that time? Do you still live with your parents? Um, we were living in like an apartment. I don't know if it's at, it's on Edgemont, but it's like, a, um, it's a, it's off, off the base birthing. Yeah. Like the apartment building. I think it might have been one, two, three, four. Edgemont. Yeah. My, we might've <laughs> lived in the same exact apartment. Yeah. Yeah. If we go to one, two, three, four Edgemont and you say, 
that's the one. I'm gonna be like, that's so crazy. We lived in the same apartment building. Yeah. Well, I did. The, I took they took all these tests and stuff, but, like um, IQ tests, IQ, OCA, aptitude, leadership. Uh, yeah, all kinds of tests, and then, yeah, uh, the scores weren't that great. So then I did EPF. Yeah, and I graduated, and they they told me I was going to AO, not to CMO. Um, okay, yeah, so that's a common one. You think you're gonna go here, and when you're on the EPF, they're like, yeah, no, you're not going there, you're gonna go over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same exact thing happened to me. Okay, so how long did it take you to do the EPF, which is, I'm gonna just say what it is, it's the Estates Project Force, which is basically kind of like a Sea Org boot camp, right? Where you yeah. kind of do marching, and you learn what a Sea Org member is. Yeah, you listen to the Sea Org tape, oh, maybe like two months. Oh, wow, that's pretty fast. So you, you could study, yeah, but you just didn't, according to them, you didn't have high test scores. I didn't have high test scores because uh, basically I was just still a kid. And I was yeah, you were 11. I was 11. You were 11. Oh my God, I just thought of, that's so funny. You didn't have high test scores. Yeah, you were 11. <laughs> what, you how, like college tests. Yeah, you know, I know. Where, how are you going to get... How are you going to be awesome on those tests when you're 11? I never in a million years thought of that. I remember getting up very early, uh, going to breakfast, uh, working, then going to lunch, then working, then going to dinner, then uh, working some more. And then um, uh, sometime uh, late at night, getting off work and just having a little bit of time to yourself before going back to sleep and starting again. I, I didn't know I would be doing hard labor in the Sea Org, you know, not, uh, I thought I was going to be just wearing a, a uniform like everyone else. Uh, I thought it was like a regular job. I didn't know I would be doing cleaning all the time. and. Um, I just, I, I never imagined that this would be my future. At first, I, um, they had me as like an MAA. Then this mission came along, they needed uh, mission personnel. So I was put on the mission and they, they expected me to stay up really, really late when I was only like 11. And I needed my sleep, you know, so I, I fell asleep one time while we were doing the mission. Yeah. And, and uh, cause they had me, uh, like staying up all night and stuff for for me for days in a row, you know. And yeah. I fell asleep because I was only like eleven, and I need my growing sleep. And so they got kicked off the mission. No. And then um, for sleeping. Yeah. Your father eventually left the Sea Org. Yes, um, I remember. He um, he blew. They call it. Um, that's where you, you you leave the Sea Org um, without permission, with a uh, the woman who was in the Sea Org with him, um, who worked for him. And they, they left the Sea Org together. Um, that's how I remember. So who from your family was still in the Sea Org after your father left? Uh, my brother, Yuri, and my uh, mother, Nancy. Um, I, I started working at the Manor Hotel when I was like 15. After the cooks and the, um, after all the cooks and the um, food preparation people left, I had to clean the whole galley by myself. It was a lot of uh, very heavy uh, work, not fun. It was like uh, being a janitor. And um, I, I only got very little pay in the Sea Org, and I was being like a janitor, and it was um, it was very terrible. I think when I was 16, I was uh, assigned to the RPF. The Rehabilitation Rehabilitation Project Force. It's a very low level in the Sea Org, where uh, where you're considered to be uh, uh, to be very inferior to everyone else in the Sea Org. And you have to wear black, and you have to run everywhere. Um, it's like a, I guess they don't have a prison in the Sea Org, but I guess it's the second best thing. If you if you mess up on the RPF, they sign you to an even lower level called the RPF's RPF. And um, I was carrying a door because uh, they had me working doing carpenter work, and I was untrained on renovating the manor. And I was carrying a door, and I, I messed up, um, and the door got like a nick in it. it got, I banged it. And so they assigned me to the RPF's RPF. We had to do uh, much, much worse uh, kind of work and jobs. One of my jobs was uh, uh, just, just the worst, like uh, carrying uh, wheelbarrows full of dirt. Just the worst kind of work uh, that's imaginable was on the RPF's RPF. I remember just waiting for the meals. Yeah, that was so like, I, it was exactly. It's just, I just gotta get to one more meal. <laughs> this, I'm just gonna, do whatever I need to do to get to the next meal. <laughs> and you don't get much time to um, wait, wait, to, to sleep, you know? And I was working on the Ethics Files thing um, um, until they decided to, they wanted to send me to in. So then okay. I, so then the I went. International management. Yeah, so okay. then, so then and I. And you were doing files, like when you say files, you were just um, 
filing KRs. A knowledge reports. Yeah. You were filing, and they were Sea Org or public or just oh, everything. Oh. But then I went over to the HGB to uh, get the sec check. Okay. And um, this we're on Edgemont, just so you know. Okay. So we're. The, I, is it past Fountain? Yeah. Where, okay. Yeah, so so I'm almost positive that we lived in the same apartment building. Then they. Um, the stats were going up. I had good stats. Um, Which was what was your stat? Number of things filed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it really was. Yeah, yeah. How would you count how many things you filed? I just would. I just you just said I had a little clicker thing. I would click it each time. I, I oh, uh, like a little counter, like a, a counter, like a little bean counter, like those guys at the clubs have. Yeah, <laughs> you had one of those for filing. Yeah, yeah, and I was like an artist. I was. I was also uh, doing, working on my um, my skills as an artist. So when I was at the HGB, they, they, I saw my file thing for the um, all the KRs they had on me and all this stuff. They had a yeah. drawing I did. I thought maybe they wanted to make me like an Ellen Hubbard artist. Oh so yeah. I, I was pretty jazzed. Yeah. But um, uh, and that's why they were saying you're going to go to Int. Yeah, it was probably, to be an artist yeah, to yeah. draw for like doing uh, art, art or promo like or, or, or yeah, yeah. something like drawings for yeah, for drawing. book, Scientology books. Yeah. And then you wanted to do that. Yeah. Okay. Because I was an artist. And, yeah. Um, and this, so it was, it was seemed like everything was going to go well. And then when it came to the sec check, I'd never, um, I wasn't used to be on the e-meter where they were using as a lie detector. If you want to go to international management, you have to pass a security check so that they know you're not a spy or your parents work for the government or something like that. <laughs> It was just too much for me to do all that mess work. I didn't. I didn't expect to be in the Sea Org doing mess work. That was like the on the EPF. You do, you do mess work and then yeah, I and then you go do a job. Yeah, I, that never happened for me. You know. What I'm saying? Oh, so you were just always doing. You were always cleaning, doing renovations. Yeah, <laughs> basically, um, I just left the Sea Org. Um, I just left the post and walked away. And um, um, I, um, my mom had me go to uh, Corlean, Idaho to live with uh, relatives. Whoa, wait a minute. I did not know this at all. Yeah, yeah. So you left Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I blew, I blew. Okay, so you blow, which means an unauthorized departure in Scientology. Like AWOL. AWOL, yeah, AWOL. Um, what is AWOL? It's... Uh, absent without leave. Absent without leave. And then um, I came back to um, uh, to pack. I was living at the... Um, I was living with my mom at the uh, Anthony building. I've been to Sea Org. I've been getting uh, $25 a week. And um, um, so I started uh, being an extra to uh, make money. I was able to be an extra in uh, some movies, um, like Independence Day, um, just some t some movies and TV shows. Like I was on um, uh, Beverly Hills 90210 and various shows. This is an extra. This is background. It was a lot of fun to be uh, on movie sets. I was uh, I was like an extra in this um, uh, '90s movie called Clueless. Yeah, you were in Clueless. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's the one with um, Alicia Silverstone. Yeah, Alicia Silverstone. Do you see? Can you see yourself in the movie if you yeah, watch yeah. it? No way. Yeah. You know where? Yeah. Which part of the movie is it? Uh, it's when they're at the house, at the Christmas house. They're at, like a Christmas party. Yeah. And, the, and I was in the kitchen, and that yeah. shows. Um, oh, you, uh, oh. Oh no. Sorry. We're going. Is he giving me a ticket? I don't know. Looking kind of neat. Is this it? Yeah. This is the one with the pool. Yeah. Dude, yeah. we lived in the same. Which floor did you live on? I lived uh, right, uh, right there on the. That's floor. your. That is where your room was. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. They they put some stucco on it. They did. It used to be kind of like beige, right? Yeah. Like a kind of brownie kind of. This is now renting. Yeah. You want to go get an apartment there? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been here in forever. Okay, so this is the complex. Wow. Oh my God, there's a Sea Org member. So, I used to skateboard down those stairs. Oh yeah, totally. Everybody did. Okay, so that's AOLA. Yeah. 
That's the fountain building. That's definitely what it was called, the fountain building. It wasn't blue. It was, they well, yeah, it. they painted. Well, now that's how you know they bought it because now it's the color. It's the same color as everything else. Do you care if we walk around? I don't want to. Okay, good. Then I will, we we will. Okay, so that's AO. Did you and you lived in the complex there? Yeah. Are you uncomfortable driving here? No, I'm okay. <laughs> I haven't been here so I just long. waved at the security guard that I've known for like 30 years, and he pointed at me like that, and I just waved back. Where are these pumpkins? Halloween, well, no, it's Halloween. Yeah, it's Halloween. I think the security guards might be onto us too, because they're, um, they watched us drive um, just now. They're kind of coming out. The guy on the bike is behind us. And this guy, they just got our license plate. Oh yeah, they're totally 100% on those. Wow, we're just walking around, driving around. I know, but uh, that guy, the security guard that just walked into the street, he just got our license plate. And then this guy is gonna come down and they're gonna ID us right now. This guy on the um, bike is literally right now coming down. Oh man. They're gonna look inside. See, there he is, see, look. And um, I told you, dude, look at that. Was that crazy or what? Yeah. They're literally circling around us, keeping track of us. Um, you okay? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we shouldn't go by the dollhouse thing there. <laughs> you don't want to? It doesn't matter to me. I don't want to. Okay, good, then we won't go. Yeah, I, I think we should, uh, not okay. stir up any more bees. <laughs> Not stir up any more bees. <laughs> you know, um, I normally don't. I normally don't get kind of weird when I go around there, but I did that time just now. I got a little like butterflies, like a look. I got a little anxious. Do you remember what happened when you had your firecracker making accident? Yeah, um, I was uh, I was like 19 years old. I was making homemade firecrackers. Um, one of the firecrackers that I made um, while I was making it, it exploded, and I um, I lost one of my eyes. This is a glass eye, and I lost both my hands. They had to be amputated because um, um, uh, the the explosion um, did, did too much damage to the hands, so they had to amputate them. But um, you, should ne you should never try to make your own fireworks or, um, or play with firecrackers or anything like that. I just, um, I was a teenager, I was 19, and I was um, um, just doing something really dumb, you know. Some people get into drugs, they get into various different things. I just, I got into uh, trying to make uh, firecrackers and um, um, I lost my hands and uh, I have uh, uh, marks on my face and uh, I made a bad I made a bad choice in my life, you know, that I regret. Yeah, there was like a piece of plastic that yeah. that um, hit the eye. Yeah. And it collapsed it. Yeah. They had to amputate it. Then to just take out the eye. Yeah, so they give me a, a glass eye. That's a glass eye right now? Yeah. Looks pretty good. Yeah. And then um, they had to amputate the hands. Okay. Um, and a different doctor did each hand on each, each side. Um, yeah. I didn't have any medical insurance, so I, they took me to a county um, medical uh but Hospital? the Sea Org people took you there. No. The Who took you there? An ambulance. An ambulance just picked you up and took you. Um, I had my brother call 911. I said call 911. Yeah. And then he called 911, and so the ambulance showed up, and then they they uh, they cut my clothing off, and then they uh, I blacked out, and I woke up uh, in the hospital. Oh no one ever contacted me from the Sea Org um, uh, or talked to me um, in the hospital. Um, the only person that visited me was my mother. His mother used Serge's money to go and visit him. And that was the only way she was, she told Serge she was even able to go, is essentially she was receiving paychecks that Serge had earned from being extras on a movie. And Serge's mother used those funds to go and visit Serge in the hospital. Well, at first uh, she, she was, uh visiting me in the hospital and then um, setting me up with prosthetics. My first prosthetics, she got them for me. She set me up with a, a place to live, a, um, a house. And then she um, just disappeared from my life. 
um, all of a sudden. And my brother, uh, too, he disappeared from my life. I have no clue what their, their lives are like today or anything. My mom um, found a, um, a room to rent uh, for me in a house in Los Feliz. I, I was staying there. Uh, I didn't have a bed, but um, I, I, I had, it was a room. It was it was shelter. Um, I had to pay the rent from Social Security that my mom, um, she arranged for me to get uh, Social Security money for um, being, being disabled. And um, uh, with the Social Security money, I was able to pay the rent. I can't say that uh, I had enough money. You know, Social Security is not that much money. I just did my best. You know, there's only, there's, there's very little money that Social Security gives, you know. She only visited me for like a period of about one month, maybe two or three times. And then, then she, then that's when she um, stopped talking to me and uh, stopped coming around. And um, uh, that was the last time that I spoke to my mother and brother. I didn't understand my brother wouldn't talk to me. Um, I didn't understand my mother wouldn't talk to me. Um, I assumed I'd been declared a SP, a suppressive person by uh, Scientology, and that they, um, I assumed that, that, that that's what happened, that they had to disconnect from me. Maybe uh, when the fire exploded, um, it disturbed an auditing session uh, or something. Or when the police arrived to investigate, Maybe the, the, the police attention on the, st on the street of, of the Scientology was um, disturbing the auditing session. Um, I assumed I'd been declared a SP because they disconnected from me. You know, that, that would be standard procedure, you know, to d disconnect from the SP. Once you're declared SP, you're, you're a suppressive person, you're a bad person, and they, they have to stay away from the bad people because they make you sick. A suppressive person is the cause of all illness, Cornell and Hubbard, why you get sick, and, um, and um, I'm the bad, bad person, you know. And that's one of the main reasons I became homeless was I was uh, left all alone um, after my accident by my, uh, by my mother and my brother. I, I have had no contact um, with the Sea Org uh, since my accident of any kind. This is the house where I was staying at. Which one, this green one? This green one, yeah. Right there? Yeah. How long did you live there for? Um, I lived there for about uh, six years. Six years? Yeah. And, and you paid rent? How did you pay rent? From Social Security. The, the... Oh, so they... Okay, but hold on a second. Because if she set it up, she set it up for you to stay there and your Social Security, you paid the rent. They didn't yeah. pay the rent for you. No, I paid, I paid, I paid rent out of Social Security. Okay, so you paid the rent out of Social Security. And then so then... So, and that, and that, so for six years. So from 1995 to when? Um... To like 2001. To 2001. 1995 to 2001. Okay, and then in 2001, what happened? Um, I became uh, uh, sort of off and on homeless. But I mean, but but why? I was uh, evicted from the from the house uh, by the uh, by the manager. Before that, um, there were some problems just with the house itself that um, it wasn't, um, um, there was a dog that had a lot of fleas in the yard and um, the fleas got all over the yard and into the house and they were everywhere. Um, there were fleas on my clothing. Um, when I was riding the city bus, I, I, I had fleas on me, I had to brush them off me. And I was, um, um, I was very uh, traumatized by the, the flea problem at the house. And um, um, so, uh, it, it, it probably was uh, not a good place for me to stay anyways. I had no support system, um, uh, no one to talk to. Um, uh, in case it was an emergency, I had no one to contact. Um, all I had was uh, just my social security money and um, uh, that was it. Originally I had uh, prosthetics and a, a glass eye, but um, um, I lost both those during the time that I was homeless. They just they just broke apart, you know. Um, that the uh, the the rubber bands broke, the the cables broke. Um, the, eventually, that there was just like a, um, a thing you could put your arm in, but then it, uh, it just then I lost it. I lost the um, while well, I was on the street. I just lost my prosthetics. I made do with uh, um, without prosthetics, you know. I just made do. So when you first were on the streets, you used to sleep in the front of this theater right here, in these little cook nooks right here. Yeah. Right in here. Yeah. Wow. I've actually seen a clip of that. Okay. 
How many nights do you think? I count. Like hundreds? Really? Oh my God, Church. We went to the Los Feliz Theater, which I cannot believe that you were sleeping on the front of. Um, was it cold? So it was cold though. It was cold. Yeah, I, 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 it definitely wasn't exaggerating when I said hypothermia. Oh, so you literally would, you would call the ambulance because you were about to freeze to death. Yeah. You would call an ambulance and then they would bring you a blanket. Yeah. Like they would come and they'd say, you'd say, I don't want to go to the hospital. I just need a blanket. Yeah, that's such a sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness, dude. I'm sorry to laugh. I just, I, it's like I'm rejecting the idea. It's so crazy to me. You know what I'm saying? My mind is like trying to process you sleeping on that movie theater. Yeah. Ugh. Okay, so... Uh, I don't even know how to say this. I saw these videos on YouTube of you. Have you seen those? There's videos of you on YouTube. Did you know that? Um, Carrie told me that there was. When you were on Hollywood Boulevard? Um, and you're like, dude, uh, you... In one of the videos, you're like about to throw down with those bid cops, you know, those private security guards that used to go up and down the boulevard? Oh, yeah. You're like about to throw down with them. They're, one guy is about to mace you. Do you remember any of this? I got maced by them. You got maced by them? Yeah. Like how many times? One time. One time? They didn't mace you in this video, but they were just about to. Do you remember that? was just like you were just you were just there so long you were just like yeah I was homeless for so long and you're just like what what is that I don't even know what is that like like what do you what's your I'm trying it's to like understand cuz sort of like being drunk like being drunk it, you feel like uh like you're uh, kind of drunk yeah um and like things are, are um um not as crisp like like right now everything's all crisp and stuff things are kind of blurry when you're yeah. homeless for a long time just like it's just, everything's just a blur I, I was I was homeless for 10 years and um, um, I was all on my own I was freezing every night in the cold um, uh, there was just no one in my life no one and no one helped me no one helped me um, I would take the uh, number four bus line um, down to the uh, to the beach I guess I was just moving around while I was homeless, but um, um, I, I, I like to sleep close to the ocean. Um, so I would, I would sleep on, by Thirsty Promenade, um, just find a little nook to lie down in and uh, go to sleep at night. I guess I, I, um, I like the ocean. I'm very grateful that I'm not homeless anymore because uh, it was so bad. Um, I was cold every night. Uh, I thought I, I thought I had hypothermia. Sometimes I, I, I lost my money. I got, uh, because I was afraid people were gonna steal my money and um, I dropped the money and then the wind blew it everywhere. And I, um, that, that really happened to me one time where I, um, I was hungry for the rest of the month. I had to wait to my next month's check to get food. I thought I was gonna die. I, I, I saw no end to it. I, I, I did see Scientologists uh, while I was homeless but they didn't talk to me. Um, no one in Scientology talked to me while I was homeless. They didn't recognize you? They must have recognized me, but uh, they, I never had a conversation, even like hello or, or anything with the Scientologist or Sierra Rimmer. I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I guess they didn't want to help me, you know. Well, all of the buildings that are on Hollywood Boulevard where uh, Serge was sleeping outside of on Hollywood Boulevard um, are C org organizations. I am positive Scientology absolutely knew that Surge was homeless right in front of their buildings. They have cameras everywhere. They have security guards who stand out on Hollywood Boulevard all hours of the day and night. Um, and they keep track of people coming and going. And they also keep track of people who they would consider situations, which Serge absolutely was a situation. His mother and his stepfather and his brother were all still in the C organization. So they absolutely would have known that Serge was homeless on Hollywood Boulevard. The fact that he was homeless outside of their buildings and they did nothing 
is appalling because they could have, somebody could have written a report even and said, hey, this is happening, and somehow it could have got sorted out, but instead they chose to do nothing. Scientology's primary focus is to make the able more able, per the words of L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology's founder. In regards to a person with a disability, Scientology believes that such a person is what they call a degraded being, which means that they have committed crimes in a prior lifetime that has caused them to deserve this condition. And there is no part of Scientology that addresses or caters to a disabled person in any way. Scientology, in my experience and being at the Los Angeles area organizations where there were homeless people, is that they try to keep them away from the property as much as they can. And there is even an, an instance where at one of their facilities on Sunset Boulevard, they actually were hosing them down. They hosed down the homeless to try to get them to move away from their property. Over here, over here, and over here, down here. Okay, so he told you uh, three, four times to get off the public street, right? Yeah. And you didn't, you haven't done anything, you haven't talked to any of them, or you hadn't... No. No, because no. you were just minding your own business, right? Take it now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they told you... I do all the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I do Yeah, I do who eventually helped get you off the streets? Um, it was a lady named Carrie Morrison. I was on Hollywood Boulevard and uh, I was at Hollywood Highland and she walked up to me, said my name, uh, Sergio Blansky. Somehow she knew my name. I was scared. I, I thought she was a lawyer. Um, so I, I didn't respond to her. I just, uh, um, I just walked away. That's when I first met her. You thought she was a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carrie Morrison, who um, was working with the police uh, to try to uh, make me uh, become conserved. The police picked me up for uh, jaywalking, and then they contacted psychiatry, and um, a psychiatrist from the Department of Mental Health um, chose to put me on a psychiatric hold. And then, then a psychiatrist saw me and decided to um, maybe conserved, go to court, become a, a conserved person. So once I got conserved, um, I was off the street and I've been off the street ever since. Carrie is the one who solved the mystery of who is Serge Obolensky. As part of her job, she was getting these people off Hollywood Boulevard. And Serge was one of the last people that they weren't able to connect with. And so that is how we tied in with that because we knew Serge and we were able to say, oh, this is where he, this is who his parents were and this is who this is. Once Carrie got him off the streets and got him into a home, then it was, uh, we didn't, I don't think we would have been able to do that part of it. So having Carrie do the first part of Serge's rehabilitation and recovery to get off the streets, that was a very key aspect of getting getting it, him to a point where the Aftermath Foundation could then help him and get him the resources and the support he needed to do these other things. It was kind of uh, scary at first uh, being conserved. It's been a lot better um, not being homeless. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot better. Carrie um, Morrison, um, connected me with my father. She said that um, uh, there's a way we could uh, talk to each other. And uh, we went to lunch, and um, I've been uh, in contact with him ever since. What was it like to see him after so many years? Um, it was a little weird. Um, I hadn't seen him for so long. Um, I didn't know if he was just going to reject me um, and um, not talk to me. I uh, just, um, I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and I, I saw he um, is married again to a, a woman named Mary Jo, and um, uh, seeing the two of them um, was was a strange experience. But um, uh, it's better to have him in my life uh, as a support. Um, uh, a support for me is is good. We went to a Coco's restaurant uh, to eat lunch together, and um, uh, we talked. And he said that uh, it might be possible for us to um, stay connected, and. Um, 
Uh, we've been connected ever since. Um, How did you get in contact <laughs> with the Aftermath Foundation? Uh, through Carrie Morrison, uh, she contacted them for me. Um, I didn't really know about the Aftermath Foundation. Um, I knew about um, um, Leah Remini and the, um, the I seen I seen her on TV, but I didn't know anything about the Aftermath Foundation. Um, Carrie um, arranged everything. Okay, so, uh, where are we right now? We're at Hanger Clinic, a prosthetics company. We're going to get some uh, prosthetics today. Awesome. How do you feel about that? Excited. Like about a, a year ago, uh, the Aftermath Foundation um, arranged for me to get uh, these new prosthetics. So um, I have prosthetics now again. What was the most satisfying thing you could do again with prosthetics? Um, just um, hold a fork or a spoon and um, eat food at a restaurant. I got a, a new prosthetic eye right here, um, a new glass eye. Um, uh, somehow they found the original people who made my original glass eye. The company had been bought by someone else, but um, they saw my medical records, and so I was able to get um, the same people a new glass eye. Going through the motions, I'm dreaming of the ocean as I swim above a riverbed. Life is so fraudulent. Towel off my guilt as I shuffle through the silt. Draw a line in the sand. Wonder where I should stand. Wow. Pretty epic. Yeah, that is epic. Better person than I have. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> there you go. Okay, you can do anything. Yeah. yeah, you can do everything. Great. That is awesome. Grab it. Grab it at all. That's heavy. That's a long man. Wow, so cool. When I first started talking with Serge, the conversations were always monosyllabic, just one word here, one word there. The biggest challenge we faced at the outset was really centered around communication because he was coming out of having been non-verbal. I helped Serge with the medical attention he needed um, by essentially activating um, a network of people, of ex-Scientologists who volunteered their help and knowledge base to really assist the Aftermath Foundation in how to best help Surge. One of our volunteers who specializes in prosthetics explained to us that all Surge needed to get new prosthetics was actually a prescription from his primary care doctor to get prosthetics. Essentially, the only thing that Serge needed was he needed an advocate. He needed somebody who could be there for him to ask these questions and navigate um, paperwork and insurance and um, doctors and who can do what. And he needed a network of people. And we had a network of people. And with Claire just orchestrating different people and finding out who was the best person to talk to for each of the things we needed, we were able to get Serge new prosthetic, uh, what do you call them? Um, hooks. We need, he wanted um, new prosthetic hooks, so we were able to get him new prosthetic hooks. And even when he needed a new eye, the company that made his original eye um, went out of business or, or closed down or, or whatever. And Claire contacted all of the places that were just in the area where Serge was living to be able to find a place that would be able to do this for him. And the place that she ended up talking to in the end that was going to do it, they had bought the other practice that had made Serge his eye many 15, 20 years ago or whatever it is. And so they had the, his file and they knew exactly what eye he had and they were just able to say like, yeah, no problem with we'll this, order it up. They knew the size, they knew everything they needed to know um, to make him a new eye because they had bought the company that made him his eye before. So it sort of uh, all kind of came together in order for him to get the attention he needed and also through the help of Carrie. Um, she was able to shuttle him around when he needed to go to places, when he needed to go to appointments. And then once he was able to go on his own and we got him a phone 
and we got if we put the Uber app on it and all these things that he needed to get around. And if he had any sort of troubles or he had any questions, he could just call us and we could talk to the doctor or talk to whoever we needed to talk to and get it resolved. And not f- for Serge, really all he needed was somebody to be on his team. And the reason that he ended up homeless, the reason he ended up losing his prosthetics, all these things that had happened is because he just didn't, he was never educated or taught how to navigate the real world. And he didn't have anybody to talk to and say, hey, can you help me navigate the real world? And just having essentially the foundation, Claire, myself, the foundation, and Carrie, just having this small group of people that had a network of other people that we could rely on we were able to get him everything that he needed to get him through all of these kind of medical and, uh, you know, just life hurdles. He just needed a little bit of direction and a little bit of help. And that made all the world a difference in keeping him on the right track to recovery. Your teeth were in pretty bad shape after being on the streets for so long. Yeah, um, I had a lot of uh, dental problems uh, with my teeth. I'd lost uh, um, six teeth. Um, I, I was when I was homeless. I had, I had not been brushing my teeth. I, I'd been um, not taking care of my teeth, and um, I had a lot of dental problems. And uh, the Aftermath Foundation um, paid for a big cosmetic makeover of my uh, my smile, and um, it was good. Give us a big smile. <laughs> they look great. <laughs> the Aftermath Foundation helped you get an iPhone. Right. Yeah, they um, they bought for me um, a smartphone, and um, I because I, I, um, I, while I was homeless, smartphones were invented, and um, I I, uh, I would never have a smartphone if I was still homeless, mm-hmm. you know, and um, it, it's necessary to have a smartphone today to um, just just be part of society, you know, and um, it's been a, it's been a really great thing to have. Well, now I, I can do text, I can um, I can look on YouTube, uh, TikTok, I can do all kinds of stuff, listen to music. And now you can video message with your dad? Yeah, I talk to my dad once a week um, on uh, FaceTime. And you are working on getting your GED now? Yeah, um, there are four tests you have to pass to get your uh, GED, um, a high school uh, clemency. Um, um, I passed two of the tests, um, the reading test and the uh, science test. And I still have to pass social studies and uh, mathematics. So um, I'm working on that right now. Why is that important to you? Well, I never graduated high school, and um, it's, it's just really important for me to have a high school education. I mean, you need a high school diploma for a lot of things, you know? Like to get a job, or um, even also just so you know the things that you learn when you go to high school. That'll help you with the job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I don't have a high school diploma. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I still didn't... don't. I never finished. Yeah, Claire is gonna um, help me. She said that um, if, once I pass the social studies test, yeah, I have the math test I have to pass. Yeah, and she's gonna um, set me up with with tutoring. Yeah, for math tutoring, so I can get through the math test. Okay, and you're gonna do that here, uh, or you gonna do it online? I don't know. She said that, like a, a tutor, like a person would help me. Okay, she's gonna pay for it. She said. Awesome. Okay. Good. Yeah, I think. Do you know uh, about that at all? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that when she did, um, when we, when the last proposal was to, uh, for the Aftermath Foundation, um, that all that stuff was included in it so that you could do your schooling as well, whatever it takes to do your school. Besides getting your GED, is there anything else you have your mindset on accomplishing? Uh, maybe uh, community college. I like to uh, try community college or getting a job. Um, off social security being able to support myself that'll be um that'd be great are your mother and brother still involved in scientology yes they are um uh, my mother still works in the sea organization my brother um he lives uh in clearwater florida um near the flag base um as far as i know he, he's uh, still a scientologist and uh, they're not in the sea Org anymore have you spoken to your brother or mother recently no i haven't spoken to them i haven't talked to them since they stopped talking to me do you wish you can speak with them um, yes, I, I very much would like to uh, have contact with my family. Um, uh, being away from my mother for so long is, um, is uh, taking a toll on me. Um, and uh, I miss my brother. I'd like to talk to him. I don't know why he's mad at me. I don't know what's going on. 
but um, uh, I thought we were friends. You know, I, I, we grew up together. I, I just, I wish I could talk to him. Do you still have hope that you will someday? Um, I guess. I guess I have hope. I mean, there's always hope, you know. Keep hope alive. Yeah. I hope that you do someday. If the Aftermath Foundation could get a video message to your mother or brother, what would you want them to know? What would you tell them? Um, that I love them. That I... I uh, have unconditional love for my family. Uh, that I miss them. That um, you know, we had we had a good time together. I thought uh, when we were growing up. Uh, I, I thought uh, they're my family, and uh, you know, family is uh, blood is thicker than water. You know, um, just um, just tell them I miss them. You know, very much. I would like to talk to them, um, even if I'm declared SP. I would like them to break the rules. And talk to me, and um, I like them to know that um, that I'm okay, that I'm not dead, that um, I'm not homeless anymore, that I have help from the Aftermath, Aftermath Foundation, and uh, from Karen Morrison, and um, my dad is helping me too. And um, um, even though we were part of Scientology, and it was it's it's, it's like a I don't want it to be a, a, something that divides us. You know, I want us to stay a family. And um, I, I would like to, to be a family again. The Aftermath Foundation is a foundation that was set up to help people that have left or are planning to leave Scientology so that they can restart their lives again. In most cases, the ex-Scientologists that we're helping are members of Scientology that were in the Sea Organization. If you leave the Sea Org and you leave Scientology, S Scientology makes it so you can't talk to your family and you can't talk to any of your friends or connections that are in Scientology. So not only are you sort of kicked out into the real world, but now you don't have any resources. And in a lot of cases, these Sea Org members are kicked out with little to nothing, the clothes that they have and whatever possessions. One of the last people that we heard said they give you $500. Like you could have been in the Sea Org 25 years, they give you $500. And they just say, okay, and that $500 is essentially a way for you to get from where you are away from them. And then they're, they're not they're, you're not their problem anymore. Scientology has been throwing people away like trash for decades, and there's been no support system for these people that have been thrown away by Scientology. And so the Aftermath Foundation was set up specifically to help this group of people so that they could start their lives over and have a successful, happy life outside of Scientology. If people want to support the Aftermath Foundation, you can go to theaftermathfoundation.org and you can volunteer to be someone who can be a resource for the Aftermath Foundation if you have a certain skill set or if you live in an area where you might be able to help somebody that we need to get from one location to another location, namely the airport or um, to a family member, um, all the way down to just making a donation to the Aftermath Foundation. And um, all that can be found at theaftermathfoundation.org. instructor for the high school equivalency program. Uh, the general education development test or GED for the high school equivalency test, uh, high set, are federal tests designed to measure the skills and concepts learned during the four years of high school. Our third award is presented to Serge Opalinski. Before coming to the ABC Adult School, Serge had passed the Language Arts and Social Studies GED exam, but needed to work on his math skills before attempting that exam again. So he enrolled in my GED high set preparation course. In class, I saw his commitment, effort, and positive attitude, all ingredients to success. 
Like many of our students, Serge has felt the sting of failing an exam. But what mattered more was that he picked himself up and kept going. We can choose to define ourselves by our problems or by our character to overcome obstacles. Serge has experienced homelessness and the loss of both of his hands due to an unfortunate accident. Despite all that, he learned to use a computer, a calculator, and take notes. More importantly, he was focused on meeting his goal. He asked questions, was supported in class by all of you, and started to understand what he could do. Serge, may you continue to take that can-do attitude instead of I can't to new places and new joys. Congratulations. Serge Kowalinski. When Serge told me he had passed his final GED test, that was incredible. Um, Serge has been through so much. Um, he is 46 years old and his entire life has been a train wreck, essentially. Um, just absolutely awful experiences you wouldn't want anyone to go through. So when he finally attained the GED, it was an incredible victory, especially for him. But for us, just as bystanders, seeing this miracle happen and seeing the transformation in Surge was incredibly powerful. Um, thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for um, the, again, the prosthetics and the, the dental work and the prosthetic eye and um, the cell phone and all the ways they've, that, um, that um, they've helped me. And um, it's, um, it's good to have the support in my life uh, of Claire and Mark um, and everybody just to, um, to support me. Um, I'd just like to say thank you. It's just really great to see um, him come from where he was to this really happy, excited, he wants to go to college. He wants to get a job. He's already started applying for jobs. Um, these are the sort of things that he's always wanted to do. And he didn't think that he'd be able to do anything in life unless he had a GED. That was like the first step for him restarting his life was he has to get a GED because in order to get a job, you got to get a GED. So he's like, okay, I got to get my GED done so then I can get a job. And once I get my GED, then I can start going to college. And so these are all the sort of things that the GED was going to unlock for search. So it was very exciting to hear that he had completed his GED. Vitamins and history books Psychology and a different way to look at it all Cause my perspective is broken If suffering's a way to earn your key I better start putting miles on my feet But I'm so tired of wandering Yeah, I'm lost But I'm living I 
thought by now pain would be my friend I know that discomfort was a means to an end But I'm lying in my bed No, I'm lost But I'm living Yes, sir. <laughs>